Hello to all my people, and if you're watching live, checking us out on YouTube, or listening on your favorite podcast provider, you are most definitely my people. Welcome to another episode of Botch Bots and Share Shots, and the premiere episode of Tea and Hot Takes on the Bloodline Entertainment Network. I am your host, a chef by trade and a mark by choice. I am the Will Gray, and joining me tonight, he is the regional favorite. He is NWA superstar extraordinaire. Alex Taylor. Alex, thanks for coming on about Chat Wrestling Wrestling, brother. How are you? I'm doing well, brother. How are you? So far, so good. It's an exciting Tuesday. I'm glad you're here. My first feature, you're going to be written up and put on the website. Like, this is big for me. So I'm, I'm excited to have you. I'm, I'm really pumped about this conversation, man. I'm glad you're here. I am glad to be here, man. I'll, you broke out regional favorite. That's a, that's a classic. I always like to, the, the best part about this, the conversation I always try to do is from beginning to end, just kind of give that 40,000 look view of your career. You know what I mean? Like everybody starts somewhere to get where they're at now. It's all part of a story, right? So for me, my story always starts with exposure. I grew up in the late 80s, early 90s, end of the NWA days, teenager during the Attitude Era, college was Ruthless Aggression, TNA. What did you grow up watching? What do you remember being exposed to as a young fan? Uh, my first memories are watching WCW with my dad. Um, so late 90s, very early 2000s, uh, Sting. Oh, I mean, yeah. Sting was the man. Um, after that, I mean, that's all like very fuzzy memories. I was really young then. Uh, but yeah, early 2000s, Shawn Michaels, Triple H. Those guys, Eddie Guerrero. That's a solid pick. That's kind of that the same coming of age around the same time I uh, I started watching. Um, funny story is, uh, found out through my due diligence talking to you and everything, we actually graduated from the ha- same high school. So that's kind of a weird small world connection right there doing that. So that was kind of super cool. Uh, shout out to GHS. Um, yeah. But knowing where you graduated high school and knowing where you're at now, I have to ask the question, man. How did you get into training? How did you become an NWA superstar? Like, where did this road start for you? Oh, man. Um, well, after high school, I uh, I went to college for a year and just it wasn't my thing. I'm a very lazy student. Um, I feel that. I, I, I loved history. I wanted to be a history major. I did great in history in college, but apparently they want you to go to all the other classes too so <laughs> that that didn't turn out well for me but uh now i moved back home and was working dead-end jobs and i figured this is what i want to do so let's go do it so i just looked up schools and i had a buddy actually tell me one day uh seth rollins just opened a school in iowa and like that night i looked it up put down the down payment and went Figured if I thought about it too long, I'd talk myself out of it. So I just spent all my money on that and moved to Iowa. So the was there any kind of culture shock or anything? I mean, that's kind of a big deal, especially when you're young, straight out of high school, packing up and moving to any school. I mean, going to a four-year university, a tech school, you packed up and went to wrestling school. Um, what was like the big changes you had to make in your life when you left? I mean, you were a young kid at that point. Uh, I don't oops. I don't know. I had two brothers growing up, so living with a couple guys in an apartment wasn't too big of a deal. Um, I don't know. It was honestly, I can't tell you too many things. I mean, all growing up, I played football, so I was used to just practice and that kind of stuff, working out. So just wrestling in general was a, a shock. Uh, hitting those ropes for the first time was a shock taking that first bump but other than that i feel like i adapted pretty well to it do you feel like i mean oh, my, sorry. My, my trainer my trainers may say otherwise they might have said i was the shits but <laughs> i thought i thought i was doing okay do you feel like going to a school like what rollins was doing there in iowa do you feel like that gave you an edge like getting ready for like tv tapings and stuff like that because there's a very drastic difference between a tv taping and then just a regular say how so or a spot show uh do you think the the training system you went through gave you an edge for being tv ready uh i would say so yeah um i mean i after after training i moved right back to tennessee started doing uh shows here and uh uh, just, I don't know how to put this in the best way, but 
a lot of guys on these shows, there's not really a great barrier for entry and they're terrible to be honest with you. I remember my first couple of shows, this is going to sound really arrogant, but I was one of the best guys there. And I, I knew then I was like, this isn't good. I shouldn't be better than all of you guys right now. I need to go somewhere where I can learn from people. And I got there eventually, but. When you look at uh, that point, then you came home, you were breaking into the business. Uh, one of the struggles I always hear across the board for everybody is getting booked. Um, how tough was it for you to get booked right out of school when you first started breaking in? Um, it, it can be a struggle, but uh, luckily for me, I it's just who you know and who's, who will say they know you. I met a guy named uh, Eric Andrews, another Gallatin guy. He got me on some uh, local shows through that. I got on some uh, Burt Prentice shows, and that's where I met uh, Danny Deals, who has been one of the uh, best people I've met in my career. He One day, he found me at a, 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 a terrible show in a terrible town, and he could see how miserable I looked. And he told me, um, Crimson is running a show in Clarksville next week. Hop in the car with me. And the rest is history with that. I went there with him, kind of just, uh, say, did some extra work, I guess. I didn't wrestle that night, but I I met everybody, did the thing. The next show they ran in Clarksville I was on. Fast forward through that, uh, Crimson's taking care of all the – through his school, he's taking care of all the ring crew guys for the NWA. So I hit him up, asked him if he could help a brother out, get me on that crew, see if I can get a look there. And that's what happened. So I owe a lot to those two guys, uh, Deals and Crimson. Uh, one of the guys in the chat, Cage My IQ, wants to know, what was one of the fun parts of learning the business from a new guy standpoint? Like when you were first getting started, like what was the exciting, one of the exciting points of the business? I mean, it's all exciting at first. Uh, it's weird signing your first autograph, going out in front of people in your underwear. That's Nervous. I ne- I didn't expect that to be like, I, I got my gear, I put it on, I looked in the mirror and I was like, I got to go out in front of people like this. This is <laughs> now it's, now it's nothing. I'll walk around in the back for hours and nothing but wrestling trunks and boots, but it's all about what becomes yeah. that norm every day. Right? Exactly. So moving a little bit into your career a little bit, I was looking through, I found some banger matches early on, but one stood out to me specifically. In 2017, you were part of the style battle with WWN. It was you and Austin Theory and Angels and AC Mac, and that was just the guys in your match, not counting everybody else that was on the card that day from Drew Galloway and everybody else that was on there. What was it like being such a young stud going into a match where there were, you know, 12 other versions of you that were just ready, chopping at the bit, ready to be the next thing. Oh, that whole, that whole weekend was a wild experience. We, uh, boys from the black and brave, they came down and met me around Nashville. And then we drove, I think 10 more hours down there. So God knows how they drove 18 hours. That's a drive right there. Yeah. They actually, they hit me up randomly one day and said, Hey, do you want to do this show? Uh, someone hooked us up with it. They knew Gabe and, I mean, yeah, that match was, and at that time, those other guys in the match, uh, yeah, I mean, I heard, I had heard their names, but they weren't anywhere near what they're doing now. So, yeah, uh, just the, uh, just the, uh, the ignorance that I had was a blessing. All right. I mean, <laughs> I've been nervous. I've been nervous a lot that time. I mean, it was what it was at the time. It's, it's just another night. So compared to where you were at then in that 2015, 16, 17 range versus where you're at now, do you still get the nerves? Do you still get the anxiety before a match or a big show? Oh, every single time, man. With the, uh, I, if the nerves go away, I don't think you should be doing it. I think being the nerves, it's different. I mean, I know what I'm doing. I'm not, I'm not nervous as in I, I'm going to go out there and embarrass myself. I'm just, I don't know how to explain it, but I think you kind of know what I mean. It's just, it's, uh, it's different, but it's good. It's a good nervous. It's a good anxious, I guess. A good nervous. I get that as, as a chef, I've been there going into a wedding or something where I know it's important. Like it's not necessarily nerves or anxiety. It's just that, that drive to be the best you can be. I I feel that I understand what you mean by that. Well, 
I'll tell you, uh, I, I'll do some indie shows sometimes, not not as much anymore, but sometimes uh, you get there, there's 20 people in the crowd, you're you're wrestling a guy you really don't want to wrestle, and in the back, you like you don't have that nerves. You're like, I don't want to be here, and that's those are the kind of things where you get hurt because you're not. So I think just being nervous, being anxious, it, it's a good thing. So as we slowly like get through your career a little bit at a time, um, I noticed that right smack in the middle of your career was the year 2020. That was an inevitable year for everybody. Restaurant industry took a big hit. The whole world shut down because of COVID. Um, as you start settling into your career, though, it's like, bam, the world stops. Um, what was it like yeah. being on the indies at that point in the Southeast, dealing with you know an ultimate shutdown of everything? How did that affect you guys on the uh, that Southeastern indie circuit? Uh, it, it definitely affected us some. Um, I think it probably affected us less than, than other places. Um, a lot of shows still ran. Um, I was heartbroken. We were supposed to do a show with uh, the Midnight Express that got canceled, but other than that, I can't think of too much stuff that, that I was really looking forward to that got canned, but it, it had an effect. And, but that's actually the same time that I got on the NWA shows was, uh, was it late 2020 or early 21? I don't remember, but so it all worked out for me. Um, another question from the chat is, do you think social media blowing up in the last few years has been a, a helpful aid in getting yourself out there for uh, promoters and bookers? I'm sure it has. I, I'm probably not as good at it as I should be. I hate social media. Uh, it's a cesspool, but you got to use it to market yourself. So, uh, Kind of looking at your career. You, you brought up the NWA. It's a, a perfect little segue. When you were 2015, as a, a young Alex, you had an opportunity, Southern All-Star Pro. You're working in NWA affiliate then uh, as a young green athlete. Then you look at where you're at now, 2023, as a bona fide NWA superstar. Like, Did you ever think you were going to be there when you 2015 as a young guy? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I even had those thoughts. I walked in that locker room and I saw a superstar like Jeremiah Plunkett. And I thought, you know, I don't know if I can ever aspire to be as great as the last troubadour, Jeremiah Plunkett. But Love Plunky. Big I, fan of Plunky. I mean, everyone is. I was watching him when I was a little kid, probably five years old, watching him on the TV. <laughs> He'll love that. <laughs> he's uh he's an alumni of the show i'll definitely make sure he sees it <laughs> um so like kind of looking through your career one of the the coolest things about what you've got to do in the nwa was very recently was the world was a vampire tour uh going down you know down under in the the land of australia um what was it like getting down there and being uh down under with billy and the boys oh it was tremendous man i wrestling's weird because uh, me and I'm sure thousands of guys have this story. I've been promised so much uh, tours of Japan, tours of this place, and then it never happens. So I kind of thought it was a rib until I got to LAX. I thought I'd get there and they'd be like, what are you doing here? We were joking. <laughs> but no, the whole thing was amazing. I even got this sweet bump on my shoulder that'll probably last forever. But no, I, it's, it was fantastic, man. Uh, it's it's weird. You walk around the back. You're surrounded by all these rock stars, and it's like, what is my life? What am I? What am I doing? I'm in Sydney, Australia, right now, getting paid to wrestle. So, not too many complaints. Uh, one of the things I find fascinating about the the American territories is, especially in the Southeast, we have a very distinct fan down here in the South. You go to, up towards Philadelphia, they're a very distinct crowd. Maine has its own pool. California and Portland and Washington, they have very distinct fills based territory to territory. Did you notice that when you got to Australia? Was there a huge difference between what the crowds wanted, the way they reacted with you guys? Um, what was the, the fans like when you got over to Australia? I mean, the fans are great. They were, they were music fans. So we had to teach them to – we had to make them like wrestling and then make them hate us. And that's what – I always say Memphis works everywhere, man. Southern wrestling will always work if it's done right. And let's shout out to the Southern Six. That's – we know what we're doing. So we can make them love, love us and we can make them hate us. 
Do you think it's easier to make them love you? Or do, is it easier to make them hate you than it is to make them love you? I've heard that, that phrase a lot. Oh. Do you think that's true? Oh, definitely. It's definitely, you can walk into Walmart and you see a guy just minding his own business. You're not, you're going to feel indifferent about him. But if you see a guy in there acting like a dick, it's too much easier to hate him than it is to care at all. So down there, you brought it up. You showed the hat, the Southern Sits. Uh, you and Thrillbilly, you guys got down there. You guys tore it up. You worked together and great. Silas, however, very different tag team partner than working with Plunky and the Ill Begotten. Um, what was it like adapting and working with Thrillbilly versus when you and uh, Plunky were together here in the States? Um, well, it's still very early in this uh, partnership in the Six, so... Well, you can't replace a partner like Plunky. He's one of the best there is. And having deals manage us, that's a that's a team that it, it's going to be hard to compare that to anything. But unfortunately, we were broken up by the NWA. And we've all had to go our separate ways, even though deals is still with us at all times. I don't know. But uh, tagging with Thrill, we'll see where it goes. We'll see uh, – if, when the rest of the six gets involved and who knows what's in store for the NWA in the future. So we've, we've kind of touched base a little bit on your career. You've, we've talked about it. You've been to Maine, you've been to down in Florida, you've been to Australia, Iowa, you've been all over the world, but in 2021, 2022, NWA came home to Nashville, man. You got to perform at the, uh, the, the fairgrounds, you got to perform at Skyway studios. What's it like coming home and being able to perform for the, the people that you grew up with and having a chance to, uh, you know, to be home with the family. Oh, uh, it's always great to come home. Um, I wish it could have been in the old fairgrounds building, but but the new one's nice too. And yeah, nothing beats Tennessee. So uh, it's it's got to be my favorite place to wrestle. I think so. Uh, do you feel when you come to Nashville, do you have a specific venue that you're just like, this is it? Like, do you have a favorite spot? A lot of people say municipal people say the old asylum out there at the old fairgrounds building. Like, do you have a specific spot in town that you really like working? Um, I don't know if there's a specific spot. Uh, I was talking about, uh, those shows Crimson used to run earlier, uh, TNT. We ran at the Wilma Rudolph event center in Clarksville. That was always a fun place to work big glass windows. It was amazing. Uh, that's in middle Tennessee. That's probably my favorite place to wrestle. Do you still feel like the heritage is there? Because you and I, we talk about it, you know, being from Tennessee, it's a strong market Memphis. Then you go out East and JCP territory. Do you feel like the indie scene still kind of carries that, that homage to the old days? In some ways. Yes. I mean, there's a lot of goofs out here too, that don't know they're asked from a hole in the ground pretending to be wrestlers, but I don't worry about them. Uh, I think it's still there. And I think it's up to guys like me and Plunkett and Thrill Billy to carry that on. Carrie Morton. We got Ricky back there leading the way. So it's, it's there. We just gotta, we just gotta showcase it. One of the perks of being in Billy's NWA, so to speak, is the fact that that man has no problems bringing in the legends. Uh, you, we've I've seen in Nashville he brought through Ricky the Dragon. You just talked about uh, Ricky Morton. Uh, we see you know Austin Idol out there every week. We see everybody that's flowing through that uh, that locker room. What's it like being able to rub elbows with so many legends from the wrestling world just week in and week out? Um, it's fantastic. Uh, it's it's funny you get. Uh... I don't know the word you get uh, numb to it, I guess you you're in the locker room one day and you just see Ricky Morton and you say, what's up? But you don't think anything about it, but that's Ricky Morton. That's Austin Idol. That's uh, I don't know, guys, even when uh, Doug Williams was with us a couple years ago, that's freaking Doug Williams. Um, guys like that. It's it's surreal when you stop and think about it. But in the moment, I mean, TV days, there's no time to think about it. You're just going. But when you really sit back and appreciate it, it is crazy. 
another piece in WA history, something that, that the company keeps carrying on the traditions forever of. And it seems like every year we get better. 2022, you got to compete here in Nashville at the Crockett Cup. But 2023, we just saw the Crockett Cup wrap up in Winston-Salem. I was there for the event. Just fire, banger match after banger match after banger match all weekend. Uh, what was it like for you while you were there at Winston with, uh, with the Crockett Cup? It was a good time. Uh, I wish my shoulder was 100%. I, I'm pretty sure I could have got Joe Alonzo, but he snuck one by on me, and all props to him. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal wrestler. He's a douchebag, but he's a phenomenal wrestler, and I can't take that away from him. But on my best day, he can't beat me. What's the excitement level like in the locker room on a day of event like the Crockett Cup when there is so much history involved with it, everything that's gone into it, historically speaking, all the way back till the 80s? Uh, what's the excitement level like day of for you guys in the back in the locker room? Um, the excitement level is always pretty high, uh, especially around something like that. You know, I wish I could have actually been in the Crockett Cup this year, but we'll see what happens going forward. Uh the injury set me back, then breaking up the OB gotten set us back. So next year, maybe we'll run it. We'll, we'll see who we got. Maybe throw me in there with somebody, and we might take the cup. So before we start getting ready to wrap everything up, um, one of my favorite questions that I've been asking a lot lately, and because it's one of those, no matter what I ask, where I ask, or who I ask, I'm going to get a very unique story and approach to it. So I'm going to ask this question to you. Uh, we're going to hop in the Wayback Machine one more time. We're going to go all the way back to day one, night one, match one. You have a chance to sit across the table from rookie Alex. What advice do you give that man today as we sit right here today? I'm giving advice to who now? To Ricky Alex, yourself. You're going back day one, night one, match one, and you're looking at yourself from across the table. What advice do you give Ricky self? Who's Ricky? Ricky Rookie. Rookie, Rookie self. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're yeah, like, who the hell is okay. Ricky, Will? <laughs> no, Ricky, you're Rookie self. Rookie, Rookie. Uh, Jesus. I don't know. I don't want... I feel like... That's a tough question. I've been hitting the head a lot since then, so I don't even – it's hard to remember my first match. Uh, it didn't calm down, I guess. Uh, but I don't think I'd give him any advice. I feel like uh, the path I went on is for a reason. I'm here now because of that. Probably made a lot of mistakes, but I'm here. So not too many complaints. All right, Alex. Well – We've done everything we can do in one time, but I can't let you off the hook that easy. I always close the same way. Five random questions that have nothing to do with wrestling. So that, that part will at least be easy for you. I got your five queued up. You ready? Okay. Question number one. What was the last TV show you binge watched? Last show I binge watched. Um, uh, Manifest, I believe. Okay. I haven't seen that one, but I'll put it on the list. It's okay. Just okay? Yeah. Okay, maybe I won't put it on the list then. <laughs> Question number two. Are there any conspiracy theories you think hold water? Um, <laughs> that the government killed JFK, but I don't want them coming here for me. So I feel like that one's not really much of a conspiracy thing anymore. No. I think we've all just kind of accepted that. <laughs> Question number three. You're on the road. It's late. What's your go-to fast food stop? Taco Bell, I guess. Anything that's open. It's hard to find stuff open these days. It's another downfall of the COVID world, man. We lost 24-hour yeah. fast food. It's always McDonald's that's open, and I'm not a big McDonald's fan, but I'll eat it if I have to. I like Taco Bell over McDonald's. I'll make that call right now. That's Definitely. my vote. Question number four. Do you know your Hogwarts house? Slytherin. You're a Slytherin. All right. Definitely. Question number five. It's the most serious question of the night, Alex. Do you think a hot dog is a sandwich? No, I don't. No. I mean, I, I've heard the argument. It's meat between bread, but no, I, don't, I wouldn't classify it as a sandwich. <laughs> All right, I told you, most of them are nonsense. But this is everybody's favorite part of the episode because I don't have to say anything. You get to plug yourself, put yourself over, tell everybody where your socials are, where to find you, any shows you've got coming up you want to promote. This is your chance, man. 
Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Alex T nine Oh two Instagram's the same thing. Um, hit up uh, angry lemonade, get some merch, uh, at the NWA shop, get some merch, get this sweet new shirt. Um, other than that, I think I'm good, man. Uh, that's all I got. Excellent. Alex, well, I appreciate you very much stopping by and chatting about some wrestling with me tonight, brother. I appreciate you having me, man. Absolutely. For everybody listening, make sure you hit that subscribe button, that like button, that bell. Make sure you leave a comment telling me how great I am or absolutely how terrible I sound. Either way, it helps the algorithm and it helps find new listeners. But for Alex Taylor, I am the Will Gray. Thanks for stopping by and listening, my people.